Support for Here and Now and the following message come from GEICO. Do you own or rent your home? Fortunately, GEICO makes it easy to bundle your home and car insurance. It's a good thing, too, because having a home is hard work. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. From NPR and WBUR, I'm Peter O'Dowd. I'm Scott Tong. It's Here and Now. Haiti is hell stepped into a nightmare, chained like a slave. Those are some searing quotes from Haitian migrants who were flown back to Haiti from a migrant camp in Del Rio, Texas. The U.S. reportedly plans to deport up to 1,000 Haitians per day and empty out the migrant camp in the next week and a half. Whitlaw Marincourt is in Port-au-Prince. You can read his reporting in the Washington Post. And Whitlaw, you spoke to deported Haitians at the airport What did they tell you about how they were treated in U.S. custody and on the airplanes? Well, uh, I was covering this wave of deportations since Sunday, and the accounts that I'm hearing from the deportees are horrific. Um, A lot of people are telling us how they were mistreated, how they felt like they were deceived by, you know, the U.S. authorities, how... They did not know and nobody told them they were being flown back to Haiti. Actually, about 10 uh, people I spoke to yesterday spoke about being chained. Chained, uh, the foot chained and the hands also are chained. Uh, On the bus, uh, sometimes on the bus, uh, others say they were chained uh, while they were boarding the airplane. Um, and one of them told me that, you know, she was, how do you say, mistreated when she was in Chile. Uh, she was the victim of discrimination and racism, but... Oh, she, you she mean this thought, is a, a, you know, a Haitian who tried to, who left years ago and tried to build, build a life in Chile before coming to the U.S.? Exactly, exactly. Um, and she was stunned by the treatment uh, that she receives on American soil. Um, and, and, and different orders have the same account as well. Wow. Now, as you describe this woman, she, I'm sure, is one of many Haitians who have been away from Haiti for years, trying to build lives elsewhere, and now they get sent home. So when they get to the airport, what do they have and where do they go? Well, a lot of these people uh, left Haiti years ago. Some of them left after the 2010 earthquake, which killed about from uh, you know 200,000 to 300,000 uh, Haitians. Um, and uh, some of them do not have relatives near the city, uh, near Port-au-Prince, where you know the U.S. authorities bring them. Um, and because of this uh, configuration of the area, you have wool swaths of Port-au-Prince controlled by gangs. Um, I mm. spoke to others who, 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 who don't have the means and who don't have the money. Because remember, it's a journey that is dangerous. One woman told me that she, um, she sold everything she had for this journey and it costed her about 12,000 U.S. dollars. It's a lot of money, um, especially for people, you know, in this situation. Um, and these people do not have the means and the capacity to, to take care of themselves. And uh, once they get to the airport, they are given uh, a few, uh, some reported $25, uh, U.S. dollars, uh, others uh, 50 U.S. dollars. Um, mm. And this is not a lot of money. This is not a lot of money. This is not yeah, even yeah. enough to pay a room at a hotel. So, so twenty five. They leave the airport with twenty five dollars. You mentioned, I mean, the gangs and the violence. There, it comes on top of an incomprehensible set of crises in Haiti: recent deadly earthquake, presidential assassination, food insecurity, and now this in the poorest country in the hemisphere. What is the capacity of the system of the government to? to help these deport, these Haitians who have been sent home? Well, I talked to the head of the Haitian National Migration, and what he told me was his staff is stressed and overwhelmed because Haiti don't, doesn't have the means and the capacity to help these people. And he said to me, it's one crisis too many uh, in the situation that the country is right now. 
we frankly do not have, we did not want, and we, we do not have the capacity to um, handle uh, this new crisis, you know. Um, it's a very, very complex and difficult situation. Yeah. That's reporter Woodlore Marincourt reporting from Port-au-Prince. His article ran in the Washington Post today. Thanks again for taking the time. Thank you very much. We've heard a lot about the long-term symptoms that sometimes come along with COVID-19, including fatigue, brain fog, and shortness of breath. But there's another delayed effect that's not as well known. It's called parosmia, a disorder that can make food, smell, and taste rancid. From Maine Public Radio, Patty White reports on a condition that doesn't have a lot of treatment options. Picture your next meal and all the choices you have. Not only the foods, but the flavors. The options can seem endless. But that's not the case for 18-year-old Molly Baker of Heartland, Maine. The past like month or two, probably all I've eaten is like bread, condiments, pasta, and sauce, really. And avocado. Right now, those are the only foods Baker can stomach. Everything else smells and tastes bad. Not just mildly unpleasant, rotten. Toothpaste is what first tipped her off that something was wrong. It was back in March, when Baker was a freshman in college. She had just bought a new tube and figured it was a different flavor that just didn't sit well with her. And then I got a hamburger, like, at my dining hall, and I took a bite into it, and it tasted, like, awful, like, garbage or something. But I was just like, oh, like, that's college dining hall food, ha, ha, ha. But then in my head, I was kind of like, this tastes the same as my toothpaste. That's so strange. A few months before, Baker tested positive for COVID-19. She says it was a relatively mild case. She had fatigue and some loss of smell. Then a few months later, her sense of smell and taste became distorted. The day after she tried to eat the burger in the dining hall, she ordered a pizza. It smelled so bad she had a friend take it away. Most food now has the same awful odor. Yeah, it's really like if you picture yourself kind of like if you go to the dump or something to drop off your trash and it's just like, oh, like that's unpleasant for like five minutes. But it's like three times as intense as that, but like for more than five minutes. It's an experience that's shared by 43-year-old Amy Bacanza Rogers of Raymond, Maine. In January, she had a mild case of COVID-19. She lost her sense of taste and smell temporarily, then got them back. But about a month later, she started to notice a lingering odor. First, she thought it might be household cleaners, maybe her shampoo. Then food started to make her gag. It smelled and tasted rancid. I was bringing home a pizza for my family on a Friday night and had to open all my windows in my car. I had to like plug my nose and I had to, I like threw it out of my car (laughs) when I got home. And when I put it on the table, I immediately went upstairs. Like I had a total breakdown. Like I was like, there's something wrong with me. I, I can't figure it out. Rogers has consulted doctors and had a battery of tests. One was a scratch and sniff smell test. Out of 45 samples, she says she could identify two, cinnamon and mint. She had a camera put down her nose to rule out inflammation as a cause. Rogers hasn't gotten a definitive answer, but smell distortion, also called parosmia, is a symptom of COVID-19. Dr. George Skangas, a rhinologist at Massachusetts Eye and Ear, says even before COVID, people experienced losses or changes in smell from viruses, and he's seen an uptick during the pandemic. And almost all of them uh, have known that they've had COVID in the past. It's unclear how common parosmia is among people who've had COVID-19, but the phenomenon has spawned support groups on Facebook with thousands of members. It's the subject of several studies, and a group of international researchers has formed a consortium to collect data to better understand how and why COVID-19 causes smell and taste issues. Dr. Skanga says with parosmia, it's likely that the virus damages nerves in the olfactory system. The thought is that, that just those nerves do not when they recover, they sometimes don't recover in the same way. They don't function in the same pathway that they did before. And signals can get crossed. And when signals get crossed, things that smell used to smell good can smell bad or different. It doesn't have to be bad. It can just be different. 
Treatments for parosmia are elusive and not always effective. So Dr. Skanga says prevention is key. He says most people take smell and taste for granted. It has a really big impact on quality of life. And that's something that people should consider, in my opinion, when they're thinking about, you know, things like whether or not to get the vaccine. Molly Baker tries to remain positive about her smell distortion. Other than that, she's healthy. As for Amy Picanza rogers the self-described foodie has lost more than 50 pounds. She has to remember to eat meals. And she wears a nose plug to block out odors. At home, while her daughter and husband share a cooked meal, she eats alone in an office. She says the condition is lonely. If we're invited somewhere to like a barbecue or something, I, I don't go because... I don't want to be rude and be like, well, your food doesn't smell good. <laughs> like People don't really understand. It's not really your cooking. It's just to me, it doesn't smell good and it doesn't taste. So it's not enjoyable to me. It's more than just the enjoyment of eating that she's lost. It's sharing it with other people. For Here and Now, I'm Patty White in Lewiston, Maine. Chinese President Xi Jinping surprised the world yesterday with this announcement at the United Nations General Assembly. China will step up support for other developing countries in developing green and low-carbon energy and will not build new coal-fired power projects abroad. Xi didn't offer much detail beyond that, but this is a major shift for China because it is the world's biggest coal producer and the largest investor in coal plants around the world. Cecilia Springer is a senior researcher with the Global China Initiative at Boston University. Cecilia, welcome. Hi, great to be here. Good to have you. And that announcement from President Xi was big news. How how did it strike you? I was very happy to hear this news. It's been a long time coming. I think it's especially notable that it came straight from China's top leader. And with such fanfare, China had been moving away from coal quietly in some places, but this really brings their commitment to the forefront. And it's going to have major implications for the clean energy transition around the world. Some of the context here is that China, for years, had helped build or finance these coal plants all around the world. It's been part of of what's known as their Belt and Road Initiative. So just give us a sense of the scale, if you could, how expansive the investment in coal abroad has been and where is most of that money going? Sure. So China has been providing finance and investment for coal-fired power plants in many, many countries around the world. And in fact, While it's involved in many different energy types, coal is receiving about 40% of the total capacity that China is supporting overseas. And most of this is concentrated in South Asia, Southeast Asia, although other regions like Africa are also seeing um, support for Chinese coal projects. And if she actually makes good on this promise, how big of an impact would it have uh, on slowing down climate change? So China has a big pipeline of coal plants in these countries and regions. And if those plants that are already planned aren't built, this could avoid something on the level of gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions, which is more than most countries emit in a year. Mm -hmm. And I think the devil will really be in the details. In his announcement, President Xi said they won't build new coal plants. Um, You heard him say Xinjiang. And I think it really matters what new means and what build means, because Hmm. China is both providing finance for these plants as well as construction services and equipment. And those are all happening at different scales. I'm trying to understand still why China would be willing to do this, to make this announcement, because I I think that part of the reason uh, they've built these coal plants over the years is to develop some sort of diplomatic or political sway in these countries um, and and to create power. So what do they stand to lose in these places where they'd be building these plants? I think that there is not a lot 
to lose on coal right now around the world. I think the sun is setting on coal-fired power generation, and it's increasingly becoming a risky investment, no matter who is making that investment. And China was really the last major country supporting overseas coal. So I think that China really only stands to gain, especially if it's moving that support from coal to renewable energy in these countries. These are countries Mm -hmm. where there's major growing demand for energy and electricity, and not having coal means that that energy is going to have to come from somewhere. And China is really well poised to replace coal finance with support for renewable energy. What uh, President Xi did not mention was coal plants at home, which they're still building, right? So so how big of a deal is this if uh, construction of coal plants still continues domestically? Yes, I think the major issue here is that this is a global climate problem, and what China is doing at home will still affect the entire world. And China does have a huge pipeline of coal-fired power plants at home. And I think China has a very ambitious pledge for the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which is to be carbon neutral by 2060 and to peak their CO2 emissions before 2030. And to do that, they're absolutely going to have to cut down this pipeline that they have at home. Cecilia Springer is a senior researcher with the Global China Initiative at Boston University. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if pollution from those coal plants in China happens to drift over Iceland, there's a chance it'll be sucked out of the air and injected into the ground for safekeeping. This month, a new project called Orca started outside of Reykjavik. That's now the largest direct air capture plant of its kind in the world. Christoph Beutler is head of climate policy for Climeworks. It's the company behind the project. He joins us now. And Christoph, uh, the machines you have run on clean geothermal power. They look like shipping containers that use fans to suck in the air. The carbon is then separated out. What happens next? Yeah, that's... uh that's the beauty uh, about the the system in Iceland. So we have partnered with a company called Carbfix, and um, because of the unique uh, geologic conditions in Iceland and very many o- other places on on the planet, um, you can basically pump the CO two down. You mix it with water. It can be seawater, and then it mineralizes within two years. So it literally turns into stone, and then it's so it's a natural process that that usually takes tens of thousands of years, and the folks at Carfix have just sped it up by a lot. How much carbon can you pull out of the air in a year? And does it really have any impact on the climate? At the moment, Orca is 4,000 tons, and it's the largest plant worldwide. But in the future, this will have to grow to gigaton scale. It will have to become one of the largest industries, bigger than oil and gas uh, currently. So what we do now is is a drop in the ocean, but it is doable. And um, we just have to start now, basically. Otherwise, we won't make the scales needed in time. Right. So uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But first, you said 4,000 metric tons a year is what you can do there with Project Orca. That's the equivalent, if I'm you know doing my math correctly, to something like a 800, 900 vehicles put out each year. So you're right. You need to scale it. How do you do it? How do you get it so that it, you can get the billions of tons of carbon out of the air that you need to? There's a, there's a number of ways. So so we have started a niche market. So we have started, for example, delivering CO2 to, to Coca-Cola Switzerland, and they put it in one of their fizzy drinks. You can make fertilizers. We have another project that's running in Switzerland where we pump it into a greenhouse where it's used as fertilizer. Two years ago, we started our kind of pioneers service where we remove CO2 from the air permanently for private individuals, companies, and even governments. And I think the idea behind is, is you can think of it in this way. So we have basically, we're a bit like Tesla. So we have built a, a Tesla Roadster. So we've demonstrated it works, but it's still expensive. And we are at the moment looking for people or companies or governments who buy down the price. So, so there can one day be the equivalent of a, of a Model 3, so to speak. Hmm. You're saying these companies, they're paying you to offset the carbon that they're burning. Is that right? Not quite. So they're paying us not to offset. Offset is usually an avoided emissions certificate. So you emit, somebody else doesn't emit, and, and, and you buy the certificate 
and thereby you, you are carbon neutral. So that's offsetting. What we are doing is net zero. So they pay us to remove their emissions. I see. And the more companies that do that, the more revenue you can make, the exactly. more affordable this becomes. Yeah, the price will come down. That's that's a given. The, the only question is, will it come down fast enough? Can we sell enough fast enough to make it big enough fast enough? If you're selling this byproduct to, to companies like Coca-Cola and they're making you know their fizzy drinks with it, doesn't that just release the carbon back into the atmosphere? Yeah, completely. Um, but what it does is it replaces fossil carbon that's otherwise used and that would create a new emission so if you if you take the co2 and basically lock it away permanently you, you're creating what's called a carbon removal or a negative emission but if you use the co2 for for a product usually it's emitted at the end of the life but then you close the carbon cycle so like nature you create a circular economy without adding new fossil co2 uh, in, in into the into the mix and that's I the other big thing we need to do there are people who might say, uh, all right, well, this sounds good, but w why don't you just plant a, a bunch more trees, invest in renewable power, or just even more importantly, fundamentally change our lifestyles and our economies? What do you say to that? Um, th that's correct, and we need all of that. But in addition, we need what we do as well on top. So it's obviously cheaper not to emit in, in many, many cases than to clean it up afterwards so yes reducing your emissions makes sense but then there are cases like for example aviation where you will very likely have unavoidable emissions because you can't go uh, and switch to batteries you, we can talk about making fuels from the co2 we take from the air that's a whole different pathway we're also looking into but uh, in essence there, there will be always unavoidable emissions climate science already knows that we don't have enough space on on, on the planet to do that just with trees the oak was about 860 times more space efficient than trees. So in essence, you can think of it as kind of industrial photosynthesis, and it's a lot smaller and a lot more efficient. Christoph Beutler is head of climate policy for Climeworks. It's a Swiss company that just opened the world's biggest carbon air capture plant in Iceland earlier this month. Christoph, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you, Peter. It has been 10,000 years since woolly mammoths went extinct. Some scientists are dreaming of using advanced DNA sequencing to bring them back, while others are still debating what caused their disappearance in the first place. Jeff St. Clair of member station WKSU in Northeast Ohio reports on that debate. Veterinarian often spends his afternoons napping. It's a very uh, soothing sound. That's napping with a K. He's a master flint napper, fashioning stone tools in his experimental archaeology lab at Kent State University. Aaron is making replica Clovis points, the large, fearsome-looking blades first discovered in the 1920s near Clovis, New Mexico. They were the signature weapon of Paleo-Indian hunters who spread across North America 13,000 years ago. They entered a landscape filled with mythical megafauna, woolly mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths, and saber-toothed cats, all of which soon disappeared. Scientists have long debated whether hunters armed with Clovis tips caused these extinctions. Aaron is using his flint napping skills to find out. Along with a mechanical spear thrower, it's basically a bow calibrated to replicate the speed of a thrown or thrusted spear. Aaron uses lumps of clay to mimic mammoth meat. He's testing how far a Clovis point penetrates. Three, two, one. Ooh, nice. So let's see how far it went into this block here, four inches. And that's going straight into flesh, no hide, no hair, nothing. I mean, if you were firing this at a actual mammoth, run as quick as you can, because all you're gonna do is annoy it. In a recent study, Aaron and his team fired different sized Clovis points into the clay meat more than 200 times. They found that, at least in the lab, the large stone weapons are not very good at killing elephant-like creatures. This evidence suggests that 
not only did we not cause the extinction of proboscideans, I don't think we could have. Todd Suravel, an archaeologist at the University of Wyoming, isn't buying it. He spent the past seven years excavating a site along the Platte River, where he believes Ice Age hunters speared a mammoth and set up camp to butcher it. He has no doubt that Clovis hunters routinely brought down elephants. I tend to believe the archaeological evidence over this experimental evidence. Not only that, he thinks these hunters were so adept that soon after arriving in North America, they killed off mammoths, mastodons, and the like. Anytime humans colonize a new environment, a massive wave of extinction follows. It's called the overkill hypothesis. The idea that if Paleo-Indians hadn't arrived here first, Europeans would have met mammoths in the New World. David Meltzer, an archaeologist at Southern Methodist University, says the overkill hypothesis coincided with the emerging environmental movement of the late 1960s. Earth Day is created in 1970, so all that stuff is swirling around. While the idea of ancient extinctions at the hands of humans served as a powerful warning, Meltzer says the dozen or so sites where mammoth bones and stone tools were found together are not a smoking gun. That's one crime we didn't commit. (laughs) We're guilty of God knows a million other things, but that's not one of them. He points to massive climate change 15,000 years ago that set processes in motion, wiping out dozens of Ice Age species without human help. The debate over whether we killed them off is more than academic. It holds open the possibility that there may have been a time when humans weren't the most destructive force on the planet. For NPR News, I'm Jeff St. Clair. Afghanistan saw more attacks today. Gunmen gunmen killed two members of the Taliban in Jalalabad, that's the eastern state provincial capital, and it follows weekend attacks that an Islamic State affiliate claimed responsibility for. But the Islamic State is not the only Taliban rival seeking influence in the new Afghanistan. Let's talk more now with Kathy Gannon of the Associated Press. She is news director for Pakistan and Afghanistan, and she joins us from Kabul. Kathy, welcome. Hi, Scott. How are you? Well, now, first of all, what do we know about the latest string of attacks by the Islamic State? Yes, um, that was today in Jalalabad. There were um, three attacks. Uh, One was a gunman opened fire on a Taliban vehicle um, at a gas station in Jalalabad, which is, as you said, the capital of uh, eastern Afghanistan's Nangarhar province. And then there were two separate explosions, um, both targeting a Taliban vehicles, and in all there were five killed, three of them Taliban, or believed to be Taliban, and uh, two civilians. So this is the latest attack, and um, mm-hmm. the Islamic State has taken responsibility for the previous ones, and yeah. the Taliban and the Islamic State are enemies. Latest in a string of attacks, Americans will remember the attack at the Kabul airport that killed more than 100 Afghans and 13 U.S. service members last month. What is the Islamic State trying to do and why are they targeting the Taliban? Sure. Well, you know, actually in the past year or so, the Islamic State has increased its activities. Um, The U.S. had... um, launched quite a a severe bombing run against the Islamic State about a year ago. Um, And the Taliban were also attacking them quite ferociously, as was the Afghan government forces. And one of the reasons that the U.S. uh, was anxious to to reach a deal or was reaching a deal with the Taliban was that they would then be recruited in the fight against the Islamic State because the U.S. sees the Islamic State affiliate in Afghanistan, their greatest Mm. threat and the greatest threat to their allies. Um, So the Taliban have been fighting them. Um, They are presenting and they probably do present the greatest challenge to the Taliban government now in power in terms of um, uh, groups that are opposed to the Taliban. Have the leaders of the Islamic State stated what their goal is here? Well, I mean, right from the outset, when they, they started in, in, in mer- first emerged in 2014, they, they've uh, taken the same goal as the Islamic State in Syria, in Iraq, and that is the establishment of a larger caliphate. And uh, 
the large percentage of the membership of the Islamic State affiliate in Afghanistan would be militants coming from Pakistan, particularly from the tribal area, um, disgruntled Taliban who um, are not happy with any kind of a, a peace deal or peace arrangement and are much, much more hardline, and as well as uh, Uzbeks from the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, um, Iranian, uh, Sunni militants, it's quite a mix of militants in the Islamic State affiliate in Afghanistan. And their goal is very similar, as I said, to that of the Islamic State in Syria and in Iraq. Okay. I imagine the Islamic State is trying to exploit what must be a delicate moment for the Taliban as it takes over a fragile country. Poverty, security issues, rival factions. What are the the big picture challenges right now for the Taliban to kind of deliver on the social contract for Afghans. Sure, and, and you're absolutely right. There are many challenges. I think the, the first one for the Taliban has been security, establishing some sort of sense of security among Afghans. And it has to be said that in much of the country, I think many Afghans will say that there is increased security in terms of being able to move a little bit more freely. The highway between Kabul and Kandahar up north to Mazar, there's a sense of greater security even within the capital, certainly in eastern Afghanistan and in, in Jalalabad, where the Islamic State has specifically targeted the Taliban, um, that, that sense of security is definitely not there. But elsewhere in the country, um, it does seem, even after just a month, that there is a, a greater sense of security. But as well as security, I think the, the, the real challenge is the humanitarian need in Afghanistan. I mean, it's just deeply, deeply impoverished. And and even after 20 years and billions of dollars, um, the poverty level in Afghanistan is, is beyond 55%. And the United Nations is saying that by the end of the year, they feel that 97% of Afghans will be below the poverty level. That means earning mm. less than $1.90 a day. Help us understand what, what you see. You're describing this extreme poverty in Kabul and elsewhere. Can you paint a little bit of a picture of what you see? Sure. You know, you have day workers, for example, literally hundreds of them on street corners and and roundabouts in the capital with their uh, gardening tools, with wheelbarrows, with uh, uh, painting material, anything just sitting there hoping that somebody's going to ask them uh, stop by and and hire them for the day. Um, People have very little to eat. You have people begging. Um, Certainly there was that before as well. Um, You do have food in the markets, but but, you know, it's it's very expensive and people cannot afford it in in, uh, large amounts. Uh, There are also a number of um, camps for displaced people where people literally are living, like 63 families with children who have no access to health care, uh, washrooms, that these outdoor toilets that are way, way overloaded, um, a small, small mm. um, screened-in area where they can wash, where the women can wash. I mean, it's really quite uh, dramatic how painfully poor some of the people are, and, and, and particularly in these makeshift camps in the parks, um, in these open areas. Yeah. And as the Taliban try to help with these daily needs, there are are other opposition groups, including the National Resistance Front of Afghanistan. Americans may recall its leader, Ahmad Shah Massoud, was assassinated just before 9-11. Tell us about this group and its footprint now. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. Ahmad Shah Massoud was was assassinated just two days before. Uh, But Ahmad Shah Massoud was among those Mujahideen groups uh, that had had ruled Afghanistan between 92 and 96 when there was a bitter, bitter civil war. So there's there's certainly that legacy as well. Um, I think that group was quite limited to the uh, one province of Afghanistan in the Panjshir Valley. And that mm. the Taliban are pretty much in control of, of that, are largely in control of that area. They're, they're, they're both sides did um, seek to have some sort of a, a, um, a meeting, an agreement. 
But certainly people in that area are frightened. Um, the Taliban has made gestures toward them. Um, but, you know, people are nervous and, and they're not clear on, on what will happen. But I think in terms of fighting, um, that has pretty much ended. And the last group, Kathy, I want to ask you about is al-Qaeda and whether it's an important rival to the Taliban now. Last month, mm-hmm. the al-Qaeda leader Ayman Zawahiri issued a new book on governments in the Muslim world. Again, many Americans will recall that name, Zawahiri, a longtime deputy to Osama bin Laden. Yeah, um, al-Qaeda is certainly not a rival um, to the Taliban. And uh, there is a concern that the Taliban have not broken complete ties with al-Qaeda. And that is one of the issues that will, uh, the, the world will be watching closely to see what kind of re- a relationship that the Taliban have with al-Qaeda, have maintained with al-Qaeda, or have cut off with al-Qaeda. So um, that is, that is a, an issue and, and something certainly the world will be looking at. Okay, that is Kathy Gannon of the Associated Press joining us from Kabul. Kathy, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you so much. On the first official day of fall, which means that cold and flu season is just around the corner. Helen Branswell has been wondering how those viruses might mix with the COVID pandemic. She's a reporter with our partners at STAT, the health and medicine publication. Helen, good to speak with you again. Welcome. Hi, Peter. And it's been a very uh, difficult September. Some hospitals around the country just overloaded with COVID patients. Considering how bad it's been lately, what do you expect this winter? Earlier in the pandemic, it was much easier to see what was coming. But after the Delta variant emerged, I I found myself really in a situation where I wasn't sure what to think, you know, about the months ahead. So I reached out to a bunch of different uh, experts who I deal with from time to time to try to get a sense of what they saw. Um, you know, some of it was a little bit more reassuring than I had expected, to be honest, hmm. given the last few months. Um, How so? You know, for, well, for one thing, um, some of the experts I talked to seemed to feel that because there had been, or there has been, such a big, big wave of cases over the summer and into the early fall, that we may not have as big a wave in the winter, that's, you know, effectively, Hmm. it will have pulled forward some of those cases. Well, in fact, you spoke with an epidemiologist at the National Institutes of Health who said that by the end of November, new cases of the Delta variant could be down at quite a low level. So if that's true, if the Delta variant does start to run its course, what could happen after that? Well, yeah, that was another piece of quite heartening news. Um, She said they constantly monitor nine different uh, modeling groups and and effectively what the models were suggesting was that because of the amount of uh, immunity in the country, both from the people who've been vaccinated and people who've been previously infected, that we could get back to um, sort of daily case counts that were where the country was sort of in June before Mm. Delta hit, which was sort of down into the 10, 15,000 cases a day. And she said, you know, we conceivably could stay there for a while. But the big if attached to that is if there is no new variant. Um, If a Delta 2.0 comes along that is even more transmissible, cases could start to rise again. Right. Now, the other thing you're thinking about um, is the flu, because this is the second flu season that we've entered uh, in this pandemic. And luckily, last year's flu was you know, practically non-existent. Did we learn anything uh, last fall that might help us as, as we get ready for this one? Um, <laughs> I think that anybody who studies flu understands that it is the most difficult thing to predict. You know, last year, it seems that the control measures that were being used for COVID, uh, you know, both by individuals, sort of masks, hand hygiene, uh, distancing, 
and by countries. You know, the reduction of international travel really drove down um, the amounts of flu transmitting virtually all over the globe. It has been at very, very low levels. So looking forward to this year, it's it's really hard to say what's going to happen. Uh, the fact that kids are back in school means that, you know, the, the prospect that they might start to transmit bugs amongst themselves is a, is a real one. And, and you mm. know, we, we could see a, a, an upsurge in all sorts of things that cause what are called influenza-like illnesses, so colds and that kind of thing. But whether or not we'll, well actually RSV. have a, RSV, yes, exactly. which, which is a yeah. respiratory illness that's already hitting kids hard. Um, do you think that hospitals are ready for, like, say, COVID, flu, and RSV if they all converge at once? That would be really tough. <laughs> I, I, I think that, you know, um, when we get to the point where there's COVID and RSV and potentially flu, it's, it's going to create a much more difficult challenge for us, not just from the point of view of managing hospital beds, but I'm not sure testing capacity is where it needs to be to mm-hmm. handle that kind, the, the kind of surge we could get in those kinds of circumstances. Uh, One more question, Helen Branswell, before we let you go. Uh, Some people may be wondering whether or not uh, getting a COVID vaccine at the same time as a flu vaccine is safe. Uh, What can you say about that? Should they be spread out a little bit? You know, um, when we first started getting COVID vaccines, the CDC was urging people not to get another vaccine. I think it was for two weeks on either side of, of your COVID shots. They have since eased that restriction. So there is no advice from them to try to put some time between a COVID booster shot, for instance, and your flu shot. Mm. Helen Branswell with our partners at STAT. Thank you so much, as always. Nice to talk to you, Peter. Here and Now is a production of NPR and WBUR Boston. I'm Peter O'Dowd. And I'm Scott Tong. It's Here and Now. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Fidelity Wealth Management. When you get a complimentary wealth planning review, Fidelity will help you develop a personalized plan. More at fidelity.com slash wealth. Investment minimums apply. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC.